Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This is part one of our three-part series on time, space, and consciousness with Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, a theoretical physicist, a mystic, author of numerous books including Parallel Universes, The Dreaming Universe, The Spiritual Universe, The Body Quantum, Space, Time, and Beyond from mind into matter, from matter into, into feeling, the yoga of time travel, and time loops and space twists, how God created the universe. Welcome, Fred. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be back with you again. It is a pleasure. We've done many, many interviews yes. together. I, I, I'm endeavoring to cover all of your books, <laughs> and it's a, it's a great body of work. It, at this point, you're one of the world's major uh, writers bringing the world, the mysterious world of quantum physics to the general public. Well, thank you for that compliment, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you. So when we talk about time, space, yes. and consciousness, we are dealing with the great fundamentals at this point, first principles, if ever there were. Well, that is exactly true, and actually we might add one more to the equation, and that would be matter, time, mm -hmm. space, matter, and consciousness. It's very interesting when you think about what the ancients, including ancient f scientists, physicists, thought about what was primary. Um, the uh, ancient physicists used uh, as their symbol of recognition of the American Physical Society, a meter stick measuring mm -hmm. space, a pendulum clock measuring time, and a kilogram mass measuring mass. Mm -hmm. So mass, space, and time were considered to be the fundamental units upon which everything is built. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly the way scientists, physicists in particular, think about the physical universe, think about the whole universe. Yeah. But you mentioned something magical that was left out, consciousness. And there is that omission is what leads into tremendous problems associated with the way in which things are measured in mm -hmm. space and time and in matter. And the thing that's missing is the mind that measures space, yeah. time, and matter. And what's even more, uh, which, which this missing ingredient, this invisible I-ness, you might call it, mm -hmm. uh, that's been left out for so many years, was imperceptible not only was invisible it was unknown it was the it was the unknown that nobody knew it was mm -hmm. the unknown unknown uh, because everybody took it for granted that what you saw was really there what you measured was really out there what you timed was really ticking off in other words everybody took it for granted that all you were were some gigantic recording instrument mm -hmm. which had consciousness had nothing to do with any of it. Right. The but quantum, ph quantum physics th threw a monkey wrench to that whole thing mm -hmm. and it said that can't be true. Um, what is unobserved is not behaving like what is observed. And what is observed isn't even behaving like what you would expect it to behave, as you would expect it to behave, if it were indeed separate objects out there moving through space and time and matter without having any interfer interference mm -hmm. or influences by the measuring or the measurer. Mm -hmm. But quantum physics says no, the measurer has a profound influence. And there is no observed until there's observer. There is no out there, out there, until there's an in here, in here. And it's that 
aspect of it which quantum physics has introduced that the action of observation is a, is is an, a transformative action it changes what's out there mm -hmm. give me let me give you a simple example if i take yeah. a coin and flip it and lands i don't look at it and i put it on my hand like that and i say what is the probability of it being heads or being tails um, everybody would guess you know one half each way 50 50 percent either way 50 50 mm -hmm. And if I say, okay, now you're sitting there and you don't know, but I'm going to do this. And I peek at the coin and I put my hand down again. And now I say to you, what is the probability that it's heads or tails? And your response would be, well, it's still 50-50. But it can't be because you know I know. Mm -hmm. You know that I've seen it. So I know it's either 100% or zero that it's heads. Mm -hmm. And that changes. Yeah. Well, for a coin, that kind of makes sense. Right. It's a personal thing. Mind is a personal thing. But when you're talking about uh, physical matter, that, that can't be affected. But in quantum physics, it is. Mm -hmm. The coin isn't even a coin until it's observed in its coinness, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So this it changes the whole thing. It brings consciousness mm -hmm. into a primary focus. In, in other words, one might even say if there were no consciousness, there would be no universe there <laughs> that is really true but that's a hard one for everybody to accept yeah. because everything seems so solid and out there I mean things is the chair is solid uh, my body is reasonably solid mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to get hit by cars blah 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 there's so much stuff yeah. telling you that there's a real out there out there that to think that the mind has anything to do with its being there uh, seems unthinkable, seems mm -hmm. impossible. Mm -hmm. But yet, that when we come down to the fundamentals upon which the gross material world is built, mind is instrumental mm -hmm. in its appearance. Yeah. Now, let's focus a little on time for a moment. The first thing that comes to my mind when I think about time is Einstein's great thought experiment. What would it be like to be riding on a photon at the speed of light? Yes, that was uh, Einstein's Greek big question was, if I'm moving at the speed of light and I held up a mirror, would I see my face? And at first, your mind does a double take on that. Well, why wouldn't he see his face? Oh, but wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. If he's moving at the speed of light, then he, the light that's f shining from his face is moving right alongside of him, and he, he, he never catches up to the mirror because it's always ahead. <laughs> so he never, he, there, it's just a blank mirror. He doesn't see anything. Uh -huh. And so the, Einstein was bothered by that. He mm -hmm. wanted to see something. Yeah. <laughs> he, he wanted to see his punum. He wanted to see his face in that mirror. Mm -hmm. So uh, he began to wonder what it is about physics that would uh, allow one to think about such things as what happens when you're moving at the speed yeah. of light. And it turns out that in order to do that, in order to understand that, he had to make a singular postulate. Mm -hmm. It was considered at that time, and it probably for all time, to be the most amazing singular postulate pulled out of the blue. Uh, other than Dirac, who I'll, we may we'll talk about a little later. Dirac later, yes. yes. Uh, that, uh, that Einstein's uh, point of view was instrumentally magical, and it was totally out of the blue. And that is that there is no speed that is greater than the speed of light. He didn't quite say it that way, but what he said is that regardless of what speed you're moving at, the speed of light, as far as you are concerned, will always be the same speed, regardless of whether you're approaching a source of light or moving away from the speed of we're moving away from a source of light. That may seem well, okay, I understand, but I do well, I it really? totally defies conventional Newtonian it, it, physics. It does, it does, because let's say you're in a uh, an airplane and yeah. you're you're flying uh, towards a city or something like that, and um, uh, you uh, uh, the airplane is moving at a say a certain speed, um, and five hundred miles an say, hour. Let's let's say a hundred miles an hour, and uh, uh, somebody uh, down below is watching. Uh, you as you're w walking down the aisle of the airplane mm. and 
uh, if he forgets there's an airplane flying and just watches you, and you're moving at say one mile an hour mm -hmm. and the airplane's going at 100 miles an hour, he just watches you, you would be having a speed of 101 miles per hour. Right. So that makes sense. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the speed of light, uh, if that was a not a human being going from one end of the airplane to the other, but a particle of light, a photon a, a, a mm -hmm. moving at the speed of light, then the person on the airplane would measure the speed to be the speed of light, but so would the person on the ground. Mm -hmm. He would see this, the light being moving at the same speed, regardless of the fact that the airplane is moving at 100 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't see the speed of light from his perspective as a speed of light plus 100 miles per hour. Yes. He would only see it the same number that you measure. And that says, drives you crazy. How can that be? How can it, how can it be that there's two contradictory stories being told here? And the answer is, when you come to light, space and time begin to change their whole texture. Mm -hmm. They become intertwangled, uh, they become intermixed, so to speak, mm -hmm. and what is space for one can be time for another, vice versa, and space-time then becomes a, a, an emerging concept. And this is what uh, Einstein's basic idea yeah. led to. And if you were riding on a photon at the speed of light and you had a watch on, the watch wouldn't move at all, would it? Well, that's the next thing which arises from this. As we said, mm -hmm. space and time change. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that when you compare the time it takes for a particle of light to go from one end to another end of, say, uh, on the rocket ship uh, or on the space uh, on 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 the airplane, you could time that, yep. and you would say, okay, it went, uh, uh, let's say, ten feet in roughly um, ten nanoseconds, because it a light travels at the speed as we would measure it as about one foot per billionth of a second one foot per nanosecond, mm -hmm. roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, then you would say, okay, well then, if you were riding on that photon and you had a clock, uh, you would show your clock elapsing exactly, uh, well, you flew 10 feet, for you must have gone 10 nanoseconds. But that isn't what happens. At the sp as you start approaching the speed of light from, say, zero speed, mm -hmm. and you get moving faster and faster and faster, your clocks get out of kilter with clocks that are not moving, and they begin to apparently slow down. Mm -hmm. Now, slowing down doesn't mean they start like, they don't like slow down, like a slow moving going no. like that. As far as a person who's who's uh, moving at that speed, everything seems normal. Mm -hmm. But when he compares uh, how long it took him to get from A to B, as to what you would say how long it took to get from A to B, his time would be shorter. And this has been confirmed experimentally. Many times, in many different ways. Yeah. Uh, I was working at the University of Illinois uh, during a time when a film was made by one of my professors, who actually showed that moving mesons uh, actually tick, uh, live longer in flight than they do on their natural in their in their in their natural way because mm -hmm. uh, uh, they would spend in their natural time they'd spend only like one or a second a couple of microseconds of their time to us it would appear longer so mm -hmm. uh, uh, time shortens as you speed right now as you speed up towards the speed of light time gets so short that it goes to zero. Not only that, but the distance you're traveling in the direction you're traveling, that distance shortens as well. So not only are you traveling a shorter period of time, you're also traveling a shorter distance, and when you reach the speed of light, distance goes to zero, time goes to zero, ergo, there is no space. There, there is no mm -hmm. time for a particle of light. So light doesn't experience space and time. If I was a photon, I would be everywhere at once and uh, every time at once. Not only that, your birth and your death would be the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well now, that seems to say something about consciousness, especially because we use the metaphor of light very often to refer to consciousness. Y yes, we do, and it's uh, an interesting uh, highlight which may evolve from this is that uh, 
the um, fact that there is no space-time tells us that there is something that emerges from that which is not space and time to something which is space and time. Mm -hmm. That which is not space and time in essence is light itself. That light itself, although it appears in space and time and is measurable by thus by those of us who are not moving mm -hmm. at the speed of light, it in essence itself is not in space and time because it doesn't experience space or time. So if it doesn't mm -hmm. experience space and time, it is does those things don't exist for it. I understand um, by way of example that it takes about eight minutes for a photon to travel from the sun to the earth. That's right. But for that photon, no time had passed between the sun and the earth. Or distance. It's or just, just, no, everything just, it, is like all at, at once. It's all, it's, all, it's all in one little point. The it's, whole universe. The whole universe. Everything. And that uh, starts to get you into the notion of Big Bangness, and mm -hmm. because uh, the big question people had, well, what happened before the Big Bang? And the answer is, there was no space, there was no time. That sounds a lot like light to me. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, there was light, and the light is what started to pour forth. And so where does mind come into all this? Well, that's a, maybe a bit of a tricky question. I'm not sure how to quite answer that uh, in terms of just light itself, um, except that there is certain hints which come to me from looking at the Kabbalah, the mm -hmm. Hebrew Aleph uh, which gives me some hint between light and consciousness. And one of the first formations uh, from that concept is that the thing which I think tells you that you're conscious is your ability to make words. It doesn't mean, it's not the thing which you feel as consciousness, but you can tell yourself you're conscious when you mention a word, when you say a word, because consciousness and words seem to be very much integrated together. And this is what uh, I kind of play with a little mm -hmm. bit. I don't quite have this totally grasped. Well, consciousness is a great mystery, yeah. and, and yet it's something that, that we all experience intimately, and, and, and typically we associate our consciousness with our body, that may be the first illusion. It may be. The, the, the best that I've come up with is that, that uh, there is a field of consciousness which is beyond space and time. It, mm -hmm. it, is not, it manifests itself in space and time, just like light manifests in space and time, but it itself is beyond space and time. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is beyond space and time, but it manifests within space and time. In other words, just as light appears to slow down and be material, for example, lasers have an impact, they, they appear to have mass in mm -hmm. some sense, um, consciousness appears as the uh, movement in some way of the material substance mm -hmm. upon which consciousness arises within. So there's consciousness in all things to some extent. Let me ask you this question. Yeah. Now Einstein combined space and time into the notion of space-time. Right. And the notion of space-time is, is, I gather, that Einstein really meant is that uh, the past doesn't really disappear. It's it's there in space time. One can one can pinpoint it. Yes. And in a sense, the future, even though it hasn't happened yet, also exists in space time. It can be pinpointed as well. Yes. Yes. The, that was called in, in, in the in the in the in, in the vernacular of the physicists. They call that the block universe. Mm -hmm. It's a block of space time. Uh, what, one of his dimensions is space and the other dimension is time. And so events mm -hmm. are points within space and time. And when you look at how relativity talks about that, um, you can see that from different observers point of view, uh, space and time can differ in terms of what is considered to be past and what is considered to be future and what is considered to be present, 
what is considered to be present from one observer's point of view, that is what is now, so to speak, from another presenter's point, of, another observer's point of view, could be series of events going off into the future or a series of events going mm -hmm. off into the past. So there is no absolute nowness. Yeah. Uh, now is dependent on what you consider to be your space-time coordination, how fast you're moving relative uh -huh. to somebody else. As I recall, uh, Einstein once wrote a letter of condolence to the wife of a colleague, another physicist, and in it he, he wrote to her that a few people would understand this, he said, but your husband and I would understand that it, there is a sense in which he's still here. His life hasn't ended with his death. Huh. I hadn't heard that, but uh, 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 because yes. he still exists, I think, in this space-time matrix. Yes. Uh, if, if you're into the block theory and you hold to it as being that way, then all events that have passed are still back there. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they are, it's possible we should be able to time travel and get to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and if all events in the future are, from our point of view, yes to be, but if they're there yet to be, we should be able to travel to the future and get to them. And we should be able to find some mechanical way, some physical way, some way of doing that. And that gave notion to the whole idea that time travel and there are Why many not? physicists who take time travel quite seriously. Very seriously. Mm -hmm. And uh, even Stephen Hawking, who doesn't take uh, these types of wilder ideas too seriously, does say, well, you can definitely time travel to the future. We're doing that right now. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. and, if he, and he knew about relativity theory, and he knew that if you travel on a rocket ship and you go off, say, at .999 the speed of light, which is not possible, but let's say you did that, not possible engineering-wise. You don't have mm -hmm. the energy to do that. And you went off to, say, Alpha Centauri, which is, say, four light years away, and then came back to Earth. Uh, as far as we were concerned, moving at that speed, you'd be mm -hmm. gone four, year, four years out and four years back. We would all have aged eight years. Yes. But people on the rocket ship wouldn't have aged more than a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would just think, it, boop, boop, and they're back. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would then have essentially time traveled into the future. One of the movies that was made called Planet of the Apes, mm -hmm. this is essentially that story. Uh, with the first one made with Charlton Heston, mm -hmm. not any of the modern versions, where they land their rocket ship on this planet, and uh, they're they're engulfed by apes who oh, are yes. intelligent. Yes. And uh, it's not till the end of the movie that we find out that they've traveled into the future, mm -hmm. and that the rocket ship had moved near the speed of light, and then come, then they didn't know they had they had turned around and came back to the same planet they left. Yes. But it was, for them, it was only a few, like a f maybe a few months of time, but it was uh, thousands of years in the future. So there are many Earth. science fiction stories that now utilize this principle. Many, many of them, and many uh, many uh, shows, what, uh, movies uh, and TV shows. One of my favorite movies uh, is called uh, The Twelve Monkeys. I don't know if you ever saw that no, movie. No, I haven't. It's a very interesting movie. It was based upon a film that was made by uh, a uh, an American living in Paris uh, uh, called uh, La Jetty. The it's the 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 jetty, the thing which sticks out into mm -hmm. the ocean, and it deals with a, a time traveler um, who uh, comes back in time and uh, to uh, stop uh, a virus from infecting the future. Uh -huh. He's from the virus-infected future, uh -huh. and the way they send him back in time, it kind of makes sense. They put him in a machine, and he goes to sleep and wakes up in the parallel past world. Uh -huh. And the reason he's able to do that is because his particular, he had some emotional events that took place in the past that were trigger events, mm -hmm. such that when he was in the future, he was able to rekindle that triggering mm -hmm. mechanism and wake up in the past in being as aware that he is from the future. I see. And so uh, this all to do with uh, how he 
gets through that story. It, mm -hmm. it was a 16 minute film, uh, beautifully done, uh, made into a, a full length movie called The Twelve Monkeys. Well, you seem to be suggesting that consciousness is able to time travel. This is where I believe I come into the equation. Uh, the, the Chris Marker's movie really it, it kind of inspired me in a way to think that time travel is really mind travel. Mm -hmm. And it's the mind that we're going, it's, this is the whole area of subjective physics, which the physicists are not going to touch because it's too dangerous. I'll, uh, I'll lose my tenure. I'll lose my grants, whatever. But that's where it yeah. is. That when we understand how, how to generate a way to use our minds uh, to dream our way into mm -hmm. the past, it's, a, it's kind of like a dream well, sequence. Of course, there's the whole discipline now of remote viewing where uh, People uh, t originally trained by the U.S. military seem to be able to place their minds in any point in space and or time. time. And time. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you see, you see the, it's so mind boggling. It, yeah. it, it, it's because we have no way of dealing with it in a any sense. It's, it's confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, anything going backwards in time throws physicists into uproars, even though we have ways of, of dealing with it. We don't. There are really, paradoxes. There are paradoxes which arise. We don't really understand what we're talking about, quite, so to speak. People can interject different ways of looking at the same thing, and it can come out with different answers. And uh, so, time reversal or time travel backwards through time is kind of a a, a pot that nobody wants to stir. Well. Fred Allen Wolf, the, our half hour has <laughs> passed very, very quickly. Uh, we're at the end of our time for okay. this first uh, episode in this three-part series, but I look forward very much to uh, the next two. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you for being with us. Be sure to check your listings for part two of our three-part series on time, space, and consciousness.